Um, I think the time has come um, because we have guests who are on a tight schedule, so you're all forgiving for coming in a bit late, but we will carry on with the show. Um, Ms. Heidi Houtela, if I can first ask you to come to the stage, Vice President of the EU Parliament, and if you could give her a warm welcome. Thank you. If you want. Okay. Good afternoon. It's really an honor to be here, uh, to, to follow through many years of work uh, by uh, the cocoa sector towards sustainability. And um, as we all know, sustainability today is a real imperative because global challenges are at a massive scale and the window of opportunity to, to, to deal with them, to so find solutions, is uh, closing if it has not closed already. But we need to, to work here and now towards solving them. And this is a task that requires full attention um, of all sectors of society, including all of the private sector. We are currently in the EU setting a very ambitious legislative framework uh, on sustainable and responsible corporate conduct. Um, it was a revelation for me in 2018 when I heard from some of you leading uh, chocolate companies of the world that uh, after years and years of uh, voluntary certificates, there was still child labor and deforestation in the supply chain of, uh, of uh, chocolate and cocoa. And that you were demanding uh, legislation to have a real solution and level playing field so that uh, the free riders would not have an advantage, but the responsible ones would uh, uh, get the benefits. So now, indeed, uh, the EU has taken the lead in enacting legislation uh, in this area. I'm talking about a number of uh, key uh, uh, instruments. Uh, primarily, we are now working on a horizontal mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. Uh, we are nearly finished with um, uh, an instrument uh, to deal with deforestation in particular. And the, the newest one is uh, an instrument aimed at tackling uh, forced labor in supply chains. And we know that also the cocoa sector has uh, this issue uh, in its supply chains. So uh, this means that um, uh, uh, required is uh, notable efforts from partner countries to ensure that sustainable value chains can exist. And I should emphasize um, this afternoon to you that the underlying themes of human rights and environmental due diligence mean continuous engagement and gradual work towards improvement. The intention is not to have companies cut out suppliers uh, and regions with most risks, but rather to work with those risks. And you will have support uh, from the EU and uh, uh, EU member state governments uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, and if um, these um, uh, ties with um, uh, suppliers and regions with most risks would be indeed cut, that would have a potentially drastic negative impact on human rights. So rather due diligence requires uh, the establishment of long-term collaboration with partners. Continuous engagement with rights holders and affected communities is also fundamental in informing this process. And sustainability is not reached overnight, it is continuous work. So indeed, this engagement should only be the very last resort decision. So let's uh, take an example, a very prominent one, child labor. What is the key to resolving child labor? Ensuring a living income to farmers and smallholders with prices that enable the respect for human rights and environment in production is indeed uh, key. Uh, purchasing practices and responsible uh, buyer behavior and especially fair prices are central elements in respect for human rights and the environment. But more specifically, as we are talking of the cocoa sector, there's also a need for support mechanisms. So, the cocoa talks uh, initiated in 2020 have been a pioneering project in bringing stakeholders around the same table to discuss the solutions to overcome the barriers to sustainability. It was a rare occasion of an integrated approach across sectors. Uh, a number um, uh, of commissioners uh, from the EU Commission Trade, Environment and International Partnerships who initiated this process. Uh, in, in 2020. 
And this summer, the parties in the COCO talks agreed on a common roadmap with specific action points. And uh, the Commission has uh, kindly agreed to host the next uh, COCO talks conference next spring. And I see that now is a decisive moment for the COCO talks. It's time to show whether the commitments made are earnest. The COCO talks have resulted in specific working group on price and market mechanisms, and we eagerly look forward to its conclusions early next year. But we equally expect all action points to be delivered by next spring. Uh, dear uh, uh, participants, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire introduced the living income differential in 2020 to arrive at a sufficient price paid to the smallholder. An estimated 90% of global cocoa production relies on some five to six millions of smallholders. However, what seems to have been happening since is that the industry has increasingly resorted to pushing down other elements of price to do away with the effect of the living income differential. And yet we know that without a decent income, the circle of poverty continues and sustainability remains hopeful thinking. And again, another revelation for myself has been to understand that very, very few cocoa producers actually ever tasted chocolate, which is such a delicacy and a luxury to us. So the future legislation on sustainable business conduct will require that industries cooperate to respond to the issue in their value chains. However, companies should not shy away from living up to their sustainability pledges already today. Coordination and collaboration to ensure purchasing practices, ensure the full fulfillment of living income can be done already now. Under the circumstances that we have seen uh, during the past week, it is understandable that the producing country governments are absent from these meetings. So, development assistance has a key role to play in supporting partner countries in adapting to the new requirements. And a high-level dialogue is necessary as a component of cooperation. I do believe that this would be an opportunity, an opp opportune moment to include a trade and sustainable development chapter in the West Africa EU Economic Partnership Agreement, something that I think also our partner countries in, uh, in uh, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire could uh, think about. That would provide a common framework on sustainability and would perhaps uh, place the COCO talks and the outcome that we expect to have in a, in a solid uh, legal framework. So the EU also has to play an active role in putting in place additional mechanisms to help ensure producer prices are maintained at the level allowing living income to farmers. Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire have called for an economic pact for sustainable cocoa. And I would like to urge the Commission to actively explore with partner countries what form this can practically take. So I believe further trust building is required and the European Parliament, myself included, stand ready to support. We all have a common objective. With this, I look forward to today's discussions and exchanges. Thank you very much. Ms. Hautler, if I can ask sure. you one question, which you kindly agreed to. Um, I was intrigued by many of the things you said, and I think you already said a lot in a very short time, but you also referred to what I think you called a tidy little framework uh, for, you know, as a component to the trade and development agreement that you see develop in West Africa as a potential solution and really support those countries. Could you say a little bit more yeah. about what the tidy little framework I might respond yes. to you a little bit. Could yeah, be. So, so we are talking about the economic partnership agreements with West Africa. And I know uh, there are challenges, many of them. So I would say that I'm just airing an idea that could be discussed uh, among the partner countries and the EU Commission. Because indeed, uh, what we have created with the COCO talks, what you have created with the COCO talks, is um, perhaps um, a, a pilot that could serve the purpose of many other commodities to find a sustainable and responsible uh, uh, framework uh, for you to get the pro products you need and for, for the farmers uh, and other parts in the, in the supply chain to get the, a, a fair price. So indeed, uh, this is an idea that we could discuss in the, in the coming months. And I, I would like to raise this question in, also in the context of the International Trade Committee of the European Parliament. So could be that this flies, could be that it doesn't fly, but I think it's time to, to look already forward with uh, what the COCO talks actually could lead in.
leading to. They could lead into something quite significant. They are already significant enough. Then, uh, no secrets in the order of speakers. Mr. Reinders, if I could ask you to come forward and give your perspective. No, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And first of all, I want, of course, to thank the uh, organizers for providing us uh, with such uh, a forum to discuss together how to best tackle uh, sustainability risk in the cocoa industry and value chain. I also thank Zaidi Otala and uh, a group of parliament members because we have had long conversations during uh, just less than two years, uh, from uh, April 20 till uh, February 22, to conclude uh, the discussions about uh, our new legislative initiative. And uh, it was very important to have uh, not only discussions, of course, with the European Parliament members, but also with many stakeholders to prepare such a new initiative. And when the Commission was uh, carrying out uh, research on due diligence, we heard from the beginning and from industry associations about the difficulties in mapping cocoa supply chains, um, not least because of uh, sourcing from hundreds, even thousands of different farmers and the many inter intermediaries involved in supply chain. Uh, in a previous slide, in the country that I know the best, of course, we have had many discussions about uh, the supply chain in the cocoa sector, and uh, I was not surprised to see such a difficulty. It's not the only one sector when you have a supply chain with so many uh, suppliers. But here, maybe what is interesting is not only uh, the number, but the number far from the European Union. And that's also an important element in the way to organize the process about the entire supply chain. On recurring concern was that any future legislation would result in increased costs for uh, smallholders, which is something that needs to be avoided at all costs. We also know the biggest concern for your industry has been since many years, was repeated by Eddie Otella, child labor, and more recently, environmental impacts linked to uh, deforestation. And there are some acute sectoral challenges uh, facing uh, this um, industry, which is why the EU has been discussing over the past two years how to make it more sustainable. Uh, we had important discussions in this context with uh, Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire, and Ghana. But I'm sure that my colleague, the Commissioner Jutta, Opilainen will no up such on this in more detail uh, in just a moment uh, in your conversations. Ultimately, our common goal is sustainability, and we try to use, of course, different policies to reach such um, a goal, not only uh, what we are doing with one new legislative uh, initiative, but also with trade policy, with development aid policy, and other kind of, of policies. And I want uh, just to talk to you about today uh, the... Um, Commission horizontal proposal to achieve uh, this goal of sustainability. And uh, so the new uh, legislation on the due diligence process, uh, it will be the first uh, legislation of its kind. Uh, it provides for the first international human rights and environmental due diligence framework and gives companies the tools to systematically look at their global value chains and the associated sustainability risks. Uh, this, proposals, this proposal translates existing international voluntary standards on responsible business conduct, the OECD guidelines, for example, into binding rules. There are also some guidance coming from the UN, but all on a voluntary basis. And here we try to move from a voluntary uh, basis to a mandatory one with some adaptations, of course, to be sure it was said that we'll have a level playing field not only for all the companies at work uh, uh, and located in the EU, but also for companies from third countries coming on the internal uh, market. We try to have a level playing field uh, very broad. And more specifically, we are setting up a framework where businesses across all sectors of the economy are more aware of the human rights and environmental risk in their own operations their subsidiaries and through their value chains. You know that in your sector that we have 
may be some concerns about human rights and environment far from the tier one, far from the first contractor that you have. Because when we are speaking about child labor, we are first of all speaking about the plantations and the different parts of the world. Um, the framework where they have more tools to effectively address this risk is important to give that to the, the businesses and where companies make their business models fit for combating climate change, including by incentivizing their directors and where directors consider the human rights, climate change, and environmental consequences of their decisions when shaping the corporate strategy. It's very important to take on board in the corporate strategy all those elements. And we consider that the proposal strikes the right balance between ambition, ease of implementation, and EU global competitiveness in order to reach this goal. Let me also make clear uh, that our goal is not to lead uh, EU companies to leave uh, countries facing issues related to sustainability and human rights violation. It is to use our economic leverage as a European society, including the private sector and the public sector, to improve the living conditions of people in these countries. It is so important in such a way to organize uh, actions with different policies that I have mentioned at the beginning of my intervention. So this is the reason why, again, we'll continue to discuss about trade, about development aid, and not only about this uh, legislative uh, initiative to organize the judicial process. Of course, companies cannot do it on their own. That is why uh, we will help them. And this is also why we see a convergence between this initiative and, I said, other policy, but also not only trade policy or development policy, but international partnerships. And it's very important to try to build some uh, international partnership, and certainly in different parts of Africa, as you have mentioned in many discussions. In this context, proportionality is key. Companies should be able to implement the rules and must have the operational and financial capacity uh, to do so. With regard to the scope, we wanted to be ambitious. In fact, if I'm looking to the national legislation till now, in the EU, more ambitious than any member state so far. And at the same time, we wanted to ensure it was proportionate, focusing on those having economic power and making it feasible for companies to apply the rules. The scope of the proposal ensures that 50% of the turnover in the union market is covered, but that means maybe 1% of the European companies with uh, such a turnover of 50% in the entire European Union. So it seems to be uh, a very few number of companies, but a huge part of the turnover in the EU. SMEs are not in the scope of application of this directive. However, we know that they will be indirectly affected as they are part of the value chain, and we want to cover the entire value chain. Uh, they will benefit uh, from supporting measures and are subject to protective provisions in the, the proposal. And so we will uh, come with some supportive measures from the EU level, and we ask also to the member states, of course, to do the same, not only with uh, some uh, advices and some uh, assistance with uh, technical support, but also with funding, of course. Looking at uh, whole value chain is crucial. At most, as most harm occurs far away in the value chain, and again, you know that in your sector that we have some concern uh, very far in the value chains. The reason why we are taking into account the operation of the company, of the subsidiaries, but of course of all the different elements in the, the value chain. And if we want to be uh, credible when we say that we want to tackle issues like, again, forced labor, to take another example, we need to have a control on the entire value chain. As regards environmental obligations, the proposal refers uh, to multilateral environmental conventions. This is in line with the approach chosen with respect to human rights in accordance with uh, UNGPs. These um, conventions are widely ratified at worldwide level, including by the EU, but also by all member states. As environmental harm can give rise to human rights violations, such adverse environmental impacts 
affecting human rights are also covered beyond the listed convention. So we try to use all the international conventions that we have uh, negotiated and ratified in the last decades at the EU level and with all the member states. And to conclude, the new uh, rules are expected to bring multiple benefits to companies such as greater innovativeness, better risk management and resilience. They will also provide benefits in terms of better customers' relations and access to finance. The Commission will also support companies so they can implement due diligence obligations efficiently and safely. As said, the proposed rules will also improve the living conditions of people in the countries with which we have trade relationships. And we will continue working with third countries, for instance, through our trade policy and through development policies, which I said Commissioner Pelainen will no doubt talk to you about. The, the proposal is uh, now with um, co-legislators, so they were again this morning, meetings in the Parliament, meetings also with the ambassadors at the EU level with the Member States, and um, we are available to work, of course, with them to facilitate the swift adoption of this important proposal. Uh, we have um, the ambition to have a, a general approach or a decision for a position of the Council, the Member States, this year, maybe, during the Czech presidency, we try to reach the goal, and we will have maybe in May uh, next year the position of the Parliament. So I mean that uh, it's a very uh, short schedule after that to organize the so-called trilogue between uh, the Parliament, the Council, and the Commission, certainly at the end of the Spanish, uh, uh, the Swedish presidency, but more than that, during the Spanish presidency and maybe the first part of the Belgian presidency just before the last uh, session, plenary session of the European Parliament in March uh, 2024. Uh, and if we, as we have done for other fields, like for instance with the GDPR, I would like to set with this directive a standard that will lead the rest of the world, in particular our like-minded partners, to move in the same direction. We have already some discussions with different partners about that. And if you look to the GDPR, now we have uh, uh, similar approaches on the five continents in many different uh, countries. And so it's quite important to take part in the definition of international standards. And I, I want just to add as a last word that, of course, you will have the time uh, to prepare your companies for the implementation of such a kind of new uh, text, because it's a directive. So if we have, I hope so, an agreement with the Parliament and the Council before the end of the mandate of this Commission, at the end of 23, or uh, in the, the first months of 24, then it will take two years for the transposition and additional two years for the high-risk sectors that we have put also in the uh, uh, the, the proposal. So from now, you have five years to think about the, the way to implement. And I know that in your sector, you are aware of all those concerns and you are already uh, delivering a lot of uh, initiative on a voluntary basis. But it's better to do that now with an horizontal approach for all the sectors and with a level playing field in all the different sectors for all the companies located in the EU, but also companies coming from abroad. But thanks again for the opportunity to present to you such a kind of uh, proposal. I'm hoping that it will be possible to maintain the level of ambition uh, in the discussions that we will now try to engage with the Council and the Parliament and to don't waste too much time because, I said, five years from now, it's far. So it's uh, urgent to conclude. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Thanks. <laughs> no, it truly was. I mean, uh, you put to shame the whole notion that um, people from Brussels uh, talk a lot, but they don't say very much. I thought it was quite a dense presentation. <laughs> um, so we're all very happy with that. One very quick follow-up question then. You highlighted all the way in the beginning already that it's very important that it doesn't fall, the burden of this doesn't fall on the producer. You got back to it a few times. I was wondering, because it was raised early in the day also, if you could perhaps say a bit more about that, about how that could be prevented. But first of all, what we try to avoid is uh, different negative impacts of the operation of the companies, uh, the subsidiaries, and the supply chain on human rights and environment. 
So it's already a first positive element just for the local communities, but also the different suppliers very far from, uh, from Europe sometimes because we'll try to improve the situation about environment and human rights. And of course, for I'm sure for many families, many families in the world, it's better to don't have uh, forced labor or to don't have uh, child labor. But more than that, of course, it's a discussion about the uh, labor conditions. And it will be, it's true, a discussion with uh, the businesses to see how it's possible to improve the labor conditions in different places in the world and to try to give an example for the farmers to give uh, uh, a minimum wage. I don't want to speak about the minimum wage that we are discussing in Europe, but at least in comparison with the revenues in the different uh, countries, a minimum wage should be able to uh, sustain their family because if they don't have the capacity uh, to give a real support to the family, they need to take the children, to give an example, uh, in the plantation to take your, your example. But more than that, I said, we'll combine different policies. And so we don't ask just to the businesses to deliver. We want to continue to work with trade policy. And you tell I said some words about the discussion that we have uh, for, for the moment with the, the different part of Africa. But uh, we want also to, to continue to work with development aid. And just to give you an example that you know maybe better than I, but I've discussed some time with some members of the sector, if you want to fight against for, uh, child labor in some plantations, it's very important to build schools, to have an obligation for the children to go to school. But to do that, you need to help the capacity building in the different countries when we try to do that. And if you are doing that, so it's very important to come with development aid. So to have a real partnership with the different countries to be sure that we are not just coming with obligation for obligations for the different uh, uh, companies to be attentive to the situation of the farmers to give the example of your sector, but also uh, to organize with the, the country concerned a real partnership about, I said, the way to build an educational system and to organize a process to uh, send the, the children to schools. And then if you are doing that, it's possible to find with other means, again, the different trafficking of uh, people organizing a traffic of children from uh, different countries to another one. That is more a criminal issue and it's uh, with uh, uh, criminal organizations. So we have different capacities. But again, the, the goal is not to ask to the businesses to go out of different countries. It's to try to avoid the harms to the environment and human rights and in collaboration with different other policies that we have the capacity to, to develop. Excellent. Thank you again. Mr. Thank Anders. you. And sorry, but I will go again to the European Parliament. <laughs> well, what better place? So we have um, another EU commissioner lined up for you, as you could see, Jutta Urpilainen from International Partnerships. Um, that, however, is a video, which I suppose we'll start playing just about now. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to address this meeting. The EU has been working hard to improve the sustainability of the cocoa sector. Let me briefly outline how. Firstly, through our Sustainable Cocoa Initiative. We launched the initiative in response to the historic agreement on a living income differential between the two main producing countries, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana and the main industry partners. Initiative seeks to ensure a decent living income for cocoa farmers and tackle social and environmental challenges. Secondly, this approach has gained traction in our cocoa talks roundtables. We know that current cocoa prices do not allow farmers to make a living. We know that a living income for cocoa farmers is a necessity for sustainable cocoa production. Thirdly, the EU supports an economic pact on sustainable cocoa. Producing countries' recent call for such a pact is a strong message. It's been heard. We must ensure that cocoa farmers are paid a more equitable price for their beans. 
EU believes responsible purchasing practices must be promoted. We also need a sector-wide, government-mandated national traceability systems for COCOA. Systems to track actions on the ground, erase malpractices across the supply chain and contribute to consumer confidence and protecting corporate reputation. In our own work, traceability is key, including in a 25 million euro package of technical assistance and budget support currently ongoing in Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana and Cameroon. Dear friends, my thanks to the World Cocoa Foundation for convening today's meeting. Improving producers' revenues and ensuring sustainable production are more important than ever. We look forward to working with you all to achieve these goals. Excellent. That was Ms. Ulfi Leinen. Yes, you can clap for her. We'll pass on the message. Um, right now, we have somebody who's been on stage uh, before, but now he will enter the stage in a different capacity and really as the new chairman of the World Cocoa Foundation. Mr. Bona, this morning you said you wanted to mostly listen in the beginning, but if you could still share a little bit with us, that would be most appreciated. Thank you. So, good afternoon, dear all, dear all members of the World uh, Cocoa Foundation. I'm happy uh, to, uh, to stand here, um, because what an energy, what a good intent, what an expertise around here in this, uh, in this room. So, um, thank you all for, uh, for being here. Thank you all for showing up and showing your uh, support, because it makes uh, a real, real difference. I really want to give a big, have a big hand of applause for the organizing uh, committee because I've seen them working over the last couple of days. I've seen them uh, particularly, yes, in the last couple of days with quite some stress on their faces. And I think they pulled it off. You're all here and I think we are having a fantastic conference. So big hand of applause for the organizers. <laughs> so, as you know by now, I'm uh, Peter Boone. I'm a uh, Dutch national. I'm a proud father of four kids. Um, I've worked in all corners of the world. I uh, lived eight years in Brazil. Um, I lived in Australia five years, uh, five years in Chicago, two years in uh, New York, Zurich, and Amsterdam is still home. So uh, in that sense, uh, I still miss Africa. So uh, maybe I should pack my bags and uh, go there because we definitely want to clo be close uh, to uh, the place where a lot of the precious uh, cocoa comes from. I'm now CEO of uh, Barry Callabout, uh, joined uh, 10 years ago, first as Chief Innovation Quality Sustainability Officer, so really involved in uh, crafting uh, the Forever Chocolate Strategy, um, really believed we needed to drive for impact, but also very, very clearly acknowledged that uh, we can't do that an alone. So the biggest thing you should remember of our sustainability uh, plan is that we said we want to make sustainable chocolate a norm for everyone. So uh, running in front uh, doesn't make a lot of sense, as I said this morning as well. And uh, that's uh, still after a stint as president of Americas, which was a lovely job. I now, uh, I'm now CEO uh, since, since the last year. Um, I had the embarrassing moment on Monday that I had to sit through a meeting where people had to cast their vote about my chairmanship. Um, so, um, I was in the room where they had to say whether I uh, could take that position. I'm very, very happy that I'm standing here now as the chairman of the World uh, Cocoa Foundation. Uh, so, big thank you to the board, uh, because they all voted for me. Um, I'm also very happy that we have Chris Vincent uh, elected as president. Uh, I've now worked over the last couple of weeks with uh, Chris. I'm 200% uh, sure that he's the right guy in the right place. And I think it would be a lot of fun, but definitely uh, I'm really looking uh, forward to work together with uh, Chris and the whole team which I met uh, yesterday, uh, because I'm absolutely believing that they drive the right course. So good luck, uh, Chris. 
I also want to have a quick, although he's not here, as we know, I want to have a quick thank you for uh, Barry Parkins, because eight years he drove uh, um, uh, the World Cocoa Foundation as chairman. I think he did amazing jobs, great achievements, and it's really thanks to his energy and through his leadership. And I think, as I saw him leading the board meeting on Monday, clearly a decisive way of leading uh, those meetings that the World uh, Cocoa Foundation is where it is uh, today. So big hand of applause for uh, Barry Parkins as well. All right, so the World Cocoa Foundation is uh, the catalyst. Um, we want to be the catalyst of a thriving and healthy and equitable uh, cocoa sector. Um, and we need all of you, ideally united behind a uh, shared vision, uh, to, make, uh, to make this happen. Nobody can do this alone. Um, there's clearly a willingness amongst all uh, stakeholders to get there, and I hope I can play my role uh, to get us there and to align us. Of course, we need, in that sense, not only the industry, we not only need uh, to have the public sector of the consuming uh, regions, uh, we really need everyone around the table. So that's why I will make a trip as quickly as I can uh, to Ivory Coast and Ghana to build, start to build the bridges uh, to them. Um, hey, maintaining the status quo in cocoa is absolutely not what we want. So there are two main things. On the one hand, as I also stressed uh, this morning, we need one shared vision for uh, cocoa farming. Uh, really, it's important, and it can differ by origin. As Barry Calabout, we source cocoa in 42 countries. So there are different models which can be deployed, but we need to have a shared uh, vision with uh, the origin country on uh, what um, uh, that future of cocoa farming looks like. But of course, the farmer at center stage. That farmer and his family need to prosper, and uh, we need to find a way uh, to that. Um, in the meantime, I think legislation, and that's why I was very uh, happy with the previous session, legislation needs to play a role. Um, uh, I really believe, uh, we heard some voices also uh, over the last couple of days about segregation. Um, segregation of um, um, uh, the kind of good cocoa, bad cocoa. I don't believe in that. I really believe uh, sustainable chocolate be needs to be the norm. Uh, we really need uh, an, a future where everyone is included, all farmers are taken care of, and all farmers have a better future than uh, they have today. So legislation at this moment uh, plays a big role, and again, a big compliment to Cabisco, to ECA, and I'm absolutely sure if I hear uh, the developments in North America, I also believe that their regulation legislation can play a role to create a level playing field and at least uh, don't uh, create a first kind of level of due diligence for the whole cocoa sector. Um, World Cocoa um, Foundation recognizes that uh, uh, it only lives with its members. So big thank you for all being here. Big thank you for all uh, keep uh, supporting, uh, supporting us. I know there's also a meeting um, uh, tomorrow already with Calbesco, with ECA, World Coco Foundation knows it can't do it uh, uh, alone. I will do everything what I can do to, uh, to support Chris and the team uh, to be successful. I have an incredible board, board officers, and an incredible board to support me. So big, big thank to, uh, to them. I know they want to support Chris and the team as much as we can. And with that, we hope that we can drive the agenda to a thriving cocoa sector, where we have less uh, child labor, where we have uh, reversed the trend of uh, deforestation, and where we absolutely have the farmer into a higher, higher income. So with that, hey, enjoy your partnership uh, meeting, and uh, please uh, reach out to me if you think I can do better to support this wonderful organization. Thank you. We will go on now. Something you've heard come up, especially in the um, presentations by the EU commissioners, is the importance of traceability. So if these legislations are being put in place, there's a lot that will be moving and a lot that will depend on can we actually build the traceability systems and can we do so in a way that is cost effective. So therefore, in one of our many last minute shifts, we move one of the breakout panels to a plenary moment, which is right now. So if we pull up the slide, um, no? Yes, sorry. And then the next one? Yes, this is the one that I was looking for. Andrew, if I can invite you to the stage and kick us off and introduce the panelists. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Wonderful to see you again after many years um, digitally. It's nice to see everybody in person and wonderful to be um, available to this conversation on this very interesting topic uh, with the evolution of recent policy. Um, so I'd first of all like to invite Menke Engelhardt up to the stage um, to join our panel. Maike is the Senior Manager for Certification, Data, and Reporting at the Rainforest Alliance. Thank you. I'd like to invite Angela Tejada Chavez, who is the Head of Sustainable Sourcing at the Hershey Company. Olivier Zwolsman from Responsible Sourcing Manager of Coco at Ferrero. And last but not least, Rui Frontura, um, who is the Fiber and Material Strategy Lead for Cotton and Crops for the Textile Exchange. Today we're going to have an interesting and multidisciplinary, multi-commodity discussion on the value of traceability within various different supply chains and how this fundamentally links to various commodities, various regulations, and various industry frameworks that are evolving over time. As a quick introduction, we're going to have each organization say a little bit about themselves, starting as Pure Perget, as a representative of Pure Perget, I'm the Global Programs Director for the organization where we seek to bring nature back to the agricultural landscape, helping to restore ecosystems, empower local community agroforestry and reforestation. And we do this in supporting a number of different initiatives on behalf of our partners, obviously, when we speak about the CFI and the evolution of where the World Cocoa Foundation has gone. Deforestation and livelihoods are key pillars of the framework. We also support companies in addressing biodiversity concerns, regenerative agriculture concerns, and on a growing basis, more and more addressing carbon through supply chain linked interventions. And that will be part of the conversation that we have today. But why are we here today talking about traceability? There has some big, been some big announcements, fundamentally, that if you are going to be bringing cocoa and a number of key commodities into the EU in the future, it is anticipated that you are going to have to have 100% traceability of those commodities, and you're going to be able to have to associate those commodities to be deforestation free. This is a significant watershed moment when it comes to addressing deforestation across major commodity supply chains that have often been associated with deforestation in the past. We see this in the EU with the regulation on deforestation free commodities, which we anticipate and as we heard, anticipate to be passed over the next year. That is a primary focus on palm oil, on soy, cocoa, coffee, cattle, wood, and the derivatives of these commodities, requiring not only legal compliance with local laws about deforestation, but actually substantial deforestation-free claims, geographically tied with full identity preservation for those claims that will be audited and verified if there's claims against you. In the US, we see the Forest Act that we anticipate as well to be um, put into adoption over the next year, hopefully, let's see. Um, which is a slightly lesser standard with regards to the deforestation-free commitment, but again requires this legal compliance and a high degree of traceability. And we know that in the UK there has already been a, a law passed, the Environmental Act of 2021, that while needing additional legislation to be enforceable, embeds a number of these protocols within UK legislation as well. So we have a pillar of legislation for the import of commodities that is, in, including cocoa, a very important commodity to this room. And we also have a separate pillar that has been a key evolution over this last year. Um, for those of you that are addressing your own GHG footprints as companies, you will be well, well aware that the science-based target initiative, the leading framework for corporate commitment making regarding carbon, is now requiring that any company that has forestry land use and agricultural emissions within their supply chains must report on the emissions from their scope three and from their, their agricultural emissions, and also must develop pathways to address this within their SBT targets, if they're to receive an SBT verified target and eventually be able to pursue a net zero um, commitment as a result of that. And for the first time in the history of GHG reporting, removals, so when we plant trees and agroforestry systems or we sequester carbon in soil, will be able to be accounted for as a reduction strategy under a company's carbon reduction pathway. And this is the first time period across the industry that this has been formally recognized as a viable pathway to address your GHG emissions. And assuming, looking at the participants in the room here, that most likely 60 to 70% of your emissions come from the agricultural landscape. And without that opportunity, it would fundamentally be impossible to reach an SBT target of an 80 to 90% reduction in GHG by 2050. So in addition to the EU regulations that our esteemed guests have spoken about today, 
we also have a parallel aspect of the carbon commitments that all of you will, are holding yourself against as we go forward to the future of a more sustainable future. And as part of that, you have a fundamental requirement, both for the deforestation-free commitments for policy, as well as for your carbon commitments under the SBT, to target proximity and have identity to the farms that you source from if you either want to comply with the EU regulations or if you want to be able to demonstrate under the GHG protocol land use guidance that you are able to use removals as part of your carbon reduction strategy. And so today, our, panels, our, our panel is going to discuss how they, in their individual roles within the industry as a certifier, as two brands, and as an industry framework and actor that supports the textile and, and fashion industry, address the concept of traceability from a practical perspective. And just to frame a quick discussion on when we talk about traceability, it doesn't mean one thing to everybody. Under the most stringent requirements, we have identity preserved traceability, which means I could put some quotes underneath. We know the characteristic of the commodity, and we know the specific details of the producer that carries that characteristic. So we know the farm, and we know it's deforestation free. From a segregated supply chain traceability perspective, we know the characteristic of the commodity, but not necessarily the specific producers, producers associated with the volume. And so this means we know it's coming from a deforestation-free landscape, but it could be from one of any 100 or 200 producers in that landscape. There's the mass balance approach, which traditionally has looked to say, look, we know that a certain proportion of the product coming through this mill or through this intermediary is sustainable, and so we'll regard it as, you know, it's 30% sustainable, or we're, we'll claim that a 30% of this cocoa coming from that intermediary is sustainable. And then finally, there's a credit trading system, which dissociates the characteristics that we're targeting, whether it's deforestation free, regenerative, what have you, carbon neutral, and dissociates that from the physical commodity, allowing you to trade the commodity and separately trade a credit for that characteristic separately. So I just wanted to lay those out as some key frameworks for the discussion today. Um, today, very excited to have Mike, to have Angela, to have Olivier, and to have Rui speaking from their own perspectives on a number of key topics that hopefully will inform the audience on private sector examples of traceability systems, leveraging innovation where innovation falls within the pathway to attain robust traceability, some of the key challenges that we face as an industry, the role of certification, where farmers fall within the benefit structure of this and where challenges and benefits to the farmer may lie, and then learning for improvement and scale. Um, so with that, we will speak about cocoa, we will speak about palm, and we will speak about cotton. Um, very excited to bring up first Mike to the, to the podium to speak uh, on behalf of Rainforest Alliance on the work that they are doing. Thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and it's exciting to see how these upcoming regulations are accelerating action. Um, I'm Maike, I'm working in the Standards and Assurance Department of the Rainforest Alliance and managing a team that is responsible for uh, making sure that we collect the data that we need, uh, that we manage it, and that we make it available also to different users. So let me first shortly introduce the main elements of the Rainforest Alliance certification program. Number one, the standard, which sets the rules that our certificate holders have to comply with. These are requirements like no deforestation, requirements around child labor or traceability along the supply chain. Number two is, is the assurance system that is designed to ensure compliance of the farm and supply chain certificate holders with the requirements in the standard and is done through third party independent uh, verification. And number three is the platform. The platform supports the certification process and traceability along the supply chain and is used by certificate holders, certification bodies, and the Rainforest Alliance. So these three elements result in verifiable and, uh, sorry, verified and traceable data on compliance, performance, and risk, and can be very useful, useful to target interventions and, uh, yeah. So let's look at what this, how this works for one of the requirements in our standard, deforestation. At the Rainforest Alliance, we prohibit deforestation, but as you all know, it's very difficult to verify that for every single farm. You need to know where to focus, right? And that's the beauty of geodata. Um, I'll give you as example a farm group wanting to get certified. For every farm in that group, we, re we receive geodata 
points or polygons. With that information, we perform a risk analysis of deforestation per point or polygon and classify it as either high, medium or low. That analysis is provided to the farm group that can then use it to verify and address risks at the farm on site before the audit. And it's also provided to the certification body who can target the audit accordingly. Only once the farm organization has gone through these steps and no deforestation was confirmed by the certification body, they are allowed to sell their volumes as certified. And that brings me to traceability. Um, Andrew mentioned it already a little bit, um, but I'll quickly go through it because it differs a little bit per, per standard. The highest and most detailed traceability level we have in our program is uh, identity preserved. For every container shipped and every sale made, basically, we know what farm organization produced it. Lower down that list is segregation. Certified and non-certified volumes are kept separate, but we don't know anymore which farm organization produced the certified volumes. And finally, mass balance, which for us works a little bit like a credit system in which, for example, I can buy 10 tons of certified cocoa, mix them with 20 tons of non-certified cocoa. And of that mixed volume, I am allowed to sell 10 tons of that mixed volume as certified. Um, just to mention that in the EU regulations that were mentioned before and that we talked about a lot and that we are talking about a lot, um, <laughs> Full traceability will be required, and that is only possible with the highest traceability, identity, traceability level, identity preserved. In the cocoa sector, however, the most common traceability level is mass balance. Um, and IP just has not had much traction yet, like in other sectors, like, like coffee, for example. Um, I'll leave that hanging there. That brings us to... Um, so we've gone through geodata and traceability in the Rainforest Alliance certification program. Um, I believe it to be robust, and I think we can play an important role in supporting companies to address deforestation and to comply with the upcoming regulations of the EU. Why? Because we are essentially aligned on every aspect. We both include cocoa in our scope. We are aligned on the definition of forest. Uh, we even go a little bit further as of now prohibiting the conversions of other natural ecosystems. Um, the regulation, the proposal now prohibits deforestation as of the 1st of January 2020, and we prohibit it as of the 1st of January 2014, which is stricter. Um, and finally, we both require legal right to land. But to finish, I want to also highlight some of the challenges we have identified. We have done over 3,000 risk analyses in the past year, including more than 2 million farmers in more than 50 countries. This is not only cocoa, by the way. This is all the commodities that we have. Um, and through that work, we have found some, some challenges. First of all, we are seeing that it's incre incredibly difficult for farm organizations to provide good quality geodata. It requires investment. It requires investment in training, capacity, time. It takes time to get the data, and it takes time to get it right. Uh, the cocoa sector has been leading in, in providing support to the farm organizations in doing that, but there is still a lot to be done. Second of all, um, we are seeing that high-risk farms are being excluded from the certified supply chains. That is understandable, but if, we, if our aim is to target deforestation and to, sorry, to reduce deforestation, we need to provide incentives for farm organizations to address risks rather than punishing it. So to conclude, geodata and traceability can play an important role in addressing deforestation, but it is just the beginning because it provides us with information on the risks at farm level, but it is what we will do with that information that will really make the difference. Thank you. So, Angela. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone, and thank you for having the time and listen to me while I'm gonna talk about traceability and cocoa. Although I have to say that you have covered quite a lot of the points I had, so now you make my job much more difficult, but that's okay. 
So that's not my slide again. I'm just going to keep going. Uh, sorry. One second. Let me just go back while we figure out. So while we figure out the slides, um, like I said, my name is Angela Tejada Chavez. I was born and raised in Peru, but I now live in Switzerland, and I've been working in cocoa value chains for now 15 years, almost. And I also did a little bit of cocoa sourcing, and the reason for that was because if I wanted my procurement colleagues to understand what we needed to change to have sustainable sourcing, then I also need to understand what it means when the market is in backward nation and when the market is in contango. And I need to understand that we need to keep the factories running to be able to keep having a business and to be able to keep supporting the farmers that are in our supply chain. So you tell me when the slides are up. I will continue without the slides. <laughs> That's all right. That's OK. So building on what, on what my colleague Mika was saying, um, really, the bottom line is I'm not going to talk too much about Hershey, but I work for the Hershey company. The Hershey company has already been in business for 125 years, for the ones that don't know about it. And we really want to make sure that we have a business for at least the next 125 years. So I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to show you our map that will show you that we have over 120,000 families in the programs that we have with nine in eight countries with nine different suppliers and I'm not going to be able to show you that so you're going to have to take a look at our ESG report and, which has much more information even the information that Andrew was saying like what percentage of our total footprint is linked to agriculture and to land use and it's quite a lot. So if you will take a look at our ESG report that we published earlier this year, it will show you that over 95% of our emissions, greenhouse gas emissions as a company, are not in our direct control. They are on the scope three. So that means that scope one and scope two, which is what we directly control, the changes that we can make in our factories, the type of energy that we can purchase is less than 5%. So you can imagine what a fine job it is to fight for resources when you don't really have control over the changes. But going back to the example, and do we have? No, that's okay. We will send the number up. So the photos that we had that I wanted to show you were two exam three, three examples. The example number one, it was a picture. Uh, it is a picture that you will see it. It's 500 hectares of cocoa managed under one farm management so one farm management, 500 hectares, producing 1,000 tons in one year. That was example number one. So I just want you to imagine for a second what 500 hectares look like, and that's like 500 uh, football or soccer fields. It's quite a lot. That produces 1,000 tons in a year. Then the second image that I had for you was, the second image, sorry, that I had for you was another image, and it had two ones. It had a village that will show a number of houses, and then it had a much bigger landscape. And if my memory doesn't fail me, it was probably one cooperative management, 700 different farm managers, or 700 farming households, however you want to call it, producing 1,000 tons in one year in 2,800 hectares. That was example number two. So imagine, we went from having these valleys and 500 football fields of cocoa producing 1,000 tons to having a much bigger piece of land producing also 1,000 tons with 700 farm managers behind and households. And the next picture was actually going to be a picture of a chocolate factory, a typical chocolate factory of the likes of Ferrero, Hershey, Mars, uh, Barry Calabot, and I'm going to stop naming, otherwise I have to name everybody else. And that type of factory is consuming 1,000 tons of cocoa in one week. And that's the size of the challenge. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if that 1,000 tons came only from one farm manager. We still need to take action. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if that 1,000 tons came from these 700 different farm managers, because we still need to take care of that. And that was my final slide. And my final slide was showing that there has been, indeed, quite a lot of work in cocoa, in mapping, in doing traceability. We have been fighting about, about uh, fighting, well, I, say, I should say, we have been intensively discussing what should be the 
appropriate overlap between GPS polygons when there is not even a land title at a central database where we can go and compare. And maybe it's time that we focus on something else. And that's what I wanted to ask. Can we call into what Michael was saying? Instead of figuring out how much more accurate we need to get, can we just go to action? Because there is a lot of plans that were already done. There was a lot of work. And we already know the reasons why people didn't adopt. And there is a lot of public literature out there as well that says, like, when people ask me, so, Angela, why don't farmers adopt? You know why? Because we didn't listen to them. Because we did decisions and we built strategies thinking logically, what will be logically. And I don't know how many of you really take decisions in a logical manner. We think we do. But at the end of the day, it's behavior. So what happened, we had very bright people coming up with logical strategies. And then implementation people had to figure out with behavior change. And how do you tell a farmer that what he has been doing for generations and what he or she has been learning for generations, that trees have a spirit, some of them will tell me, senorita or whatever, I cannot cut the tree. I cannot cut the tree branch because it's what gives me food. What is the logic of me cutting those branches? There's no logic. For them, there was no logic, because for them, trees have life. How can you cut something that is alive? So we had to deal with that, and the field teams had to deal with that. And maybe, and I really like what you said, Peter, maybe, maybe, just maybe it's time for listening, and time to be a little bit more humble, and just roll up our sleeves, get on to do things, because there's quite a lot to do. And in the meantime, I'm very happy to say that we have been able to maintain amazing investments, but we can do better in how they can be used. Thank you. Well, I just want to say uh, much respect for you. Um, for doing the presentation, improvising without having the slides with you to support you. So, and also complimenting Hershey for the great work you're doing on uh, cocoa sustainability. Um, my name is Oliver Zwolsman. I work uh, at Ferrero. Um, I'm uh, responsible for our cocoa sustainability programs, but I'm not standing here today in that capacity. I'm here uh, to speak about palm oil because this uh, topic today is about learning, uh, say, from other commodities. Um, so I'll be speaking on that behalf. But at the same time, I'm, I'm Dutch, so you kind of grown up with uh, sustainability, whatever commodity it is. So uh, you kind of have it in your DNA. So I just want to take about the lessons learned. And uh, just going to the first slide uh, here. So I think important here when we talk about cross-commodity learnings is that um, you know, it's, it's, uh, we have the same logic for any Ferreo procurement category that we have. And I think that's important to emphasize. So when learning, so you apply the same logic. And um, I think within Ferreo, uh, responsible sourcing, which, which I'm part of, is embedded in the broader procurement division. So it's completely integrated with each other. I work on a daily basis with our cocoa procurement manager, but also on Palmo, it's the same thing. So we work closely together on managing the supply chain. But this logic is important, and of course, first and foremost, when it comes to due diligence, it's about to be able to demonstrate compliance. So for that reason, we developed this so-called staircase approach. And on the left, you see, uh, say, the bar with risk. So the higher the risk level of a certain category or certain commodity within that category determines the higher up you go on the stairs. And I mean, at the bottom, there will be, uh, say, all for, uh, suppliers of real acknowledging our supplier code, but then depending how far you go up uh, this, uh, this road. Another important thing just to highlight here, when we talk about uh, this topic here today, um, and, you know, you need to have a long-term focus. So for us at Ferro, one of the core values is long-term, uh, say, relationships with our suppliers. And with that, I don't only mean, say, tier one suppliers, but beyond the tier one supplier as well. I mean, that's really essential. Uh, and also, the way we see traceability, whatever the commodity is, it's the cornerstone of any sustainability activity you do. And uh, we will go also to see then what level of traceability, but it's the cornerstone. It's not an end goal for sure, but it's a very important means to the end. So today I will focus on, on traceability. 
Um, and so we have sort of minimum requirements, and then depending on the risk level, we go higher up. Uh, minimum requirements that we need to know who are tier one suppliers, where they are based. But if I go to the next slide, you will already see the level of complexity. So this is our traceability, what we call degree. And uh, say also here the same logic applies. The higher the risk level in a particular commodity, the higher, uh, say, we go up this, this ladder. So in, in, in Ferrero, for example, we look at agricultural commodities. And when I mention Ferrero procurement categories, I don't only mean agricultural raw materials. I mean all media procurement, technical procurement, general procurement, all Ferrero procurement categories fall under the same logic. So we see here the uh, trace PT degree, starting at the bottom, knowing the origin country where your suppliers are, uh, but then going up further the ladder. So knowing your farm groups, knowing the farms, um, you know, polygon mapping, um, and also going to satellite monitoring. So the important thing, what you want to know is that who are your suppliers, and not just your tier one supplier, but in palm oil, for example, you need to know also the plantations, where the, the mills, the plantations. For cocoa, it means knowing not just, uh, say, the tier one suppliers, but also the farm groups with who you have a long-term relationship and the farmers that are member of that farmer group. But so applying this logic uh, means that, um, and we have three key commodities in terms of agriculture, which is not only palm oil, but also cocoa and hazelnut. So this traceability degree that you see here, we are applying to all three commodities that I just mentioned, which uh, means polygon mapping, but also applying satellite monitoring. What does it mean in practice? It means what you're seeing on this picture here, uh, for the three commodities, and of course today I will focus on palm oil, by applying the same logic and going all the way up to the trace speed to degree, this is what you're able to see. And we've been working with different providers, so in, uh, say for, we've uh, worked with SourceMap that we're using for both um, uh, cocoa and palm oil, uh, and also for hazelnuts, but also for palm oil, for many years we already worked with uh, Starlink, which is collaboration with Airbus and with Earthworm, uh, applying satellite monitoring. Um, but the important thing is that with these tools, you can see your supply chain in one platform, one data management platform, which again is important to demonstrate compliance. So for example, with plantations, be able to see if there are any deforestation risk alerts, um, but also uh, it supports you very heavily in uh, your strategic decision making. So which investments you want to do where with whom, this is uh, say key to make those uh, decisions. But you say you see the same logic um, here. and. So it's not just saying who are your suppliers, but also where is it coming from, how much do they produce. So, for example, you see at the bottom the hazelnut, so you see the flow of the hazelnut, where it's coming from, but you also see the quantities on those uh, supplies, and then, of course, under which conditions has it been produced. So I think this is very important because this is, I think, in light of what we're discussing here today, key. But there are also some very important differences if you compare cocoa and palm oil. So whereas in cocoa you have smaller farmers, in Palma, it's completely different. You have large plantations owned by large suppliers uh, from whom we source the far majority of our uh, palm oil. And that's a big difference because that creates a completely different complexity. Um, in that sense, cocoa is much more complex because you have uh, many farmers, and the same in hazelnuts. You speak about roughly four to 500,000 farmers of hazelnuts that you need to map. Um, and that's different in palm oil. Then in Palmo, there's a challenge because it's about the smolders that are around those plantations that you want to include in the supply chain. So how do you map those? How do you say, get visibility on that supply chain, that flow of, uh, of goods to the mills? Um, but there are some, indeed some important differences. And in, in cocoa, there's also high turnover of farmers, which is, of course, in palm oil, much less. But the important thing um, here is how far do you go with your traceability? So with palm oil, the key thing is not only to go up to the mills that you source from, but to go beyond the mills. So if you uh, have, a, say, mind to trace a bit of degree on the previous slide, uh, we have been polygon mapping all the plantations that we are sourcing from. So we have to trace a bit beyond the mills to the plantations. And why is that important? For this reason. So when you talk about, say, deforestation-free verification uh, on palm oil, um, the important thing, so I'm not going to go into all the percentages that you see here. The important message here, because we have the traceability all the way to the plantations, um, we can better, say, manage the deforestation risk alerts. But as you can see, we have roughly one million hectares of, uh, say, uh, palm oil plantations. But the number of deforestation risk alerts we have on average on an annual basis is not more than 30 that we have to manage and then uh, check. 
Because why it's such a low number of, uh, say, um, risk alerts? Because we have visibility on the plantation, so when a satellite monitoring is trying to detect deforestation, you can see if it's in or outside a plantation. And that, say, um, is critical. So and that's the same with palm oil. If you have, say, a G GPS waypoint of farms, you don't know if it's inside the buffer zone or inside a protected forest area. If you have polygon mapping, it's much more, say, um, uh, precise. So just going to the last slide in that sense. So we have a standard operating procedure for managing deforestation risk alerts, which means that if through the satellite monitoring we identify a possible deforestation risk alert, which you see here circled, say, at the corner of one of the plantations we have in our supply chain, we will then send boots on the ground, as we call it. So there will be people that go on the ground to see if it's really inside or outside, in this case, the plantation. And if it's inside, then there will be a corrective action plan with the supplier. So this is also with strong engagement with the supplier that this is done. But in this case, what they found out after going really on the ground and do the verification work is that there was actually a, a plantation of rubber, uh, say, next to the Palmo plantation where the deforestation had taken place. So we manage the alerts, but the fact that you can have such a low number of deforestation risk alerts is because you have a high level of traceability. And I think that's an important parallel with, with COCO. If you have all your farms polygon mapped, which for us is a minimum requirement for West Africa, um, it means that you have also, say, much able to the, uh, better able to identify if any farms are in or outside protected forest areas, then if they are, say, in buffer areas, there will be boots on the ground to see if they're really inside or if additional measures are needed. Um, but I would say uh, there is a big complexity in Palm oil for sure, with all the deforestation taking place. But um, as I said, it is also at the same time uh, a different uh, complexity as what we see in, uh, in Coco. So I would like to leave it to this, uh, but just to give you a bit of a, a context of Palm oil and the, the similarities, but also the, the differences between uh, Palm oil and, uh, and Coco. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know I only got a seven minutes, but I, I've got to say, well done, Angela. I think the last thing you want to do is come into a room full of people and not having your slides to speak to. So I hope my slides work. <laughs> um, so I'm Rui Fontora. I work for Textile Exchange. Um, uh, my role in the organization is to uh, help the strategy of called preferred cotton global production. Um, a bit of um, preferred cotton is obviously cotton that's recognized under a standard of certification. And I just want to say that because it's a term that we're hearing here quite a lot. And I will be talking about preferred fibers quite often during my presentation. Um, a textile exchange in some ways is similar to WCF. We are also a non-profit organization. Um, you know, we, uh, we have around 800 members globally. We have around 48,000 sites certified to our eight active standards. Um, and we have 11 cotton roundtables, um, which those cotton roundtables is exactly to catalyze and accelerate the adoption of preferred fibers. And yet yeah, we do 20 years this year. We started back in 2002. We started focus on cotton. Our CEO and co-founder, Larry Pepper, um, was, a, was a farmer on a fifth generation of farmers who were working on organic cotton. And organic cotton standard was, was the one that we had within our organization. Um, we also have a strategy. I think we, um, we start looking at um, a bit of what we do, we're doing. And back in 2019, um, you know, we wanted to set up a clear goal to the industry. We then that with the help of external partners to try to define what would be the right thing to do for us as an organization to raise the bar around preferred prefer fibers. So Climate Plus is our vision for 2030, which is about helping the textile industry reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030. And we don't want to do it that in isolation, so we want also to look at critical areas which we as an organization need to work on. So soil health, biodiversity, and water are those three key pillars in our strategy. The plus means data. And a lot of that is required to the traceability piece of work I'm going to talk about. But without that, you know, we will not be able to, to progress and, you know, being able to, to deliver to the industry the support and the guidance that we require for adoption of preferred fibers. Um, specifically on cotton, within that um, strategy, um, 
Obviously, we wanted to continue to educate the industry. We continue to uh, produce and publish a lot of reports focused on tier four, fibers productions, um, focus on regional content. More and more, we are trying to look at more detailed data at the regional level, rather than taking, ta or taking global average, because I think uh, the same probably happened in the cocoa world. You know, cotton dash produced in Brazil versus cotton dash produced in Australia is completely different. Um, and then raise the bar on prefer. I think sustainability has become a word that a lot of us use quite often, a lot of the industries use quite often, but we need to be more content to it. So we're working on a new definition or elevated definition for prefer, and it's a piece of work that we're doing with the UNFCCC, and we love acronyms within our organization as well, and I find it quite difficult to say sometimes, uh, but we're doing that in collaboration. A lot of the things we do is in collaboration with our organizations, of course. And then scale regenerative practices, for sure, something that we've um, been promoting quite often. We launched a report at the beginning of the year. That work is continuing. And it was great to um, talk with one of, one of you during the breaks a little on about regenerative practice in the, in the cocoa world as well. I also played, which is fantastic. And obviously, um, I'm only talking about all these four uh, uh, indicators within the cotton direction of travel because none of this would be possible without accessing data and nothing would be possible without improving traceability. So just a quick explanation of how this works on the cotton world, which is probably similar to other things, but you know, there is a material verification, a physical verification as well. Um, we also, we don't do it ourselves, but we're promoting forensic authentication or traceability. We launched quite recently a report which um, textile traceability assessment provided an industry of many options that may exist for physical traceability. Uh, within that um, um, material verification, there is a, what we call chain of custody, which is the core for all our standards in terms of transaction verification. Um, and finally, there is a, a site verification, a scope um, verification, which is basically just a verification of the feasibility of the site to hold that standard. Um, and this is what we're working on, digitalizing the um, process of we existing currently in terms of standards. So there is a material verification at the top, there is a site verification at the end. In between, there's what we call the chain of custody. So the system that we're developing, and we're going to launch it in January 2023, or quarter one of 2023, will incorporate all of our standards. They will not all be one at the same time, but one by one, they will all be part of this digital system. We call it Track It. Um, so currently, as you can see, you know, there's a lot of segregated steps. There's a lot of uh, physical transactions or transaction certificates between one site and the other. Those sites need to have a scope certificate. We don't do those certifications. We rely on certification bodies, and I can't carry on for quite a lot longer. So we decided to digitalize the, the the, the system. I think, you know, if you think about blockchain, that's probably a bit of what we're trying to do. And obviously, the first step is to digitalize what exists, and then the next step is moving to an electronic system. Um, the best way I have to describe this um, was told to me by our director of data and technology. Imagine um, you know, transactional money. In the past, you will have to have physical notes back and forth. That's how you had to do it. Um, we then move into a system that we're going to the bank, we put the money in, and that automatically appears on your bank account. That's the digital phase. Electronic phase is we don't even go to the bank. We just get the money in our bank account, we transaction from one way to the other, whatever way you want it. And that's the intention. And I'm just going to show another slide to display a bit more what that means on real terms. Um, so this is how the tracker system works. So you've got all those key players in the, in the Excel supply chain, one, two, three, four, five, and then you multiply that by five or six times. You know, that's how many transactions will probably exist within the supply chain for one product. So um, the sites will have to be certified, which is the scope certificate. Then they will originate a transaction certificate that needs to be verified by the certification body to then be able to um, been verified by ourselves because what we do, and, and this is one of the drivers for us to digitalize the system, is we reconcile, reconcile, apologies, we reconcile the data. And we do that to maintain the integrity of the preferred fibers. So uh, this is how the system works, and you know, this is basically what we currently exist, and we're trying to bring it to a platform that all the brands or all members can access. The future will be for all the supply chain being able to assess that, but basically bringing a lot of transparency, which with that brings a lot of uh, integrity within the preferred fibers and materials within the textile industry. 
So as you, if you remember earlier when I was talking about the electronic uh, system, which is the future, so the so those transaction certificates no longer go by the certification borders, they come in directly to us. So more uh, quicker access to the data, being able to reconcile their data, and being able to provide that information and identify any faults or errors, if they may exist, in the system much quicker than we can do now. We are also working on a lot um, I'm running without time, apologies. But we also work, I just want to make a reference, my colleagues mentioned that before. We're also working on a geospatial system, which is another layer they'll be adding on onto the digital system that we currently got, which is similar to some of what my colleagues are also doing. Um, and finally, yes, we also have our annual meeting. We also have an annual meeting as well. We have one in America, uh, sorry, yes, in America, in Colorado, in November. So if you're around, you'll be most welcome. But the intention is the same as here, get people together to talk, collaborate, and, and, and share their experience. So thank you for listening. Perfect, can you hear me? Do this, yes, perfect, thumbs up, anybody? There you go, okay, perfect. Um, well, wonderful, uh, thank you all. Um, I think it's been quite interesting to hear and demonstrative of the different places that various actors may be with regards to this concept of traceability uh, across different commodities, across different verticals, um, when we come to this topic. Um, you know, thank you, Rui, from, uh, from Textile Exchange in, in demonstrating that for the cotton space, and you know, having participated in the textile exchange conversation, seeing the consolidated number of actors that you have within the organization, there is becoming this central focal point of a possible traceability system that, that balances cost and practicality. And I think one thing we can recognize in, in cotton that may differ from cocoa, which is the, the, the core topic here, is that cotton is not on one of the listed uh, commodities within the EU regulated list for deforestation free commodities, nor for the US or nor for the UK. And so we see a level of flexibility that is appropriate within cotton when you can have the characteristics of the commodity be tied to the specific commodity itself, but it doesn't necessarily have to take that additional level for geographically located aspects because if it's regenerative and you can prove that, that's satisfactory. If it's carbon neutral and you can prove that, it's satisfactory. Um, you know, thank you, Olivier, for demonstrating where and how the level of integrity of, of data collection can actually lead to efficiencies as well, right? I think when you speak about the, the risk uh, indicators and flags that you've received from those supply chains that you where you had greater data granularity and lesser uh, granularity, how that actually can affect your operations and help you manage a system that is productive in that. Mike, for demonstrating the value that certification systems can have um, within the context of identity preserved types of traceability that we all know can be quite challenging. Um, and Angela, obviously, for you know, the call to action, the sense of, of taking action, you know, leading with outcomes as the desired goal, as opposed to necessarily KPIs or indicative administrative aspects of getting to those outcomes um, as the fundamental goal that we want to see. And, and to kind of share and a concern in that space is there's about 12.9 billion tons of carbon that falls within the scope three category of company supply chains associated with agriculture on an annual basis today. When you look at the UNFCCC's goals to address a 1.5 degree target, we are talking about basically one third of total emission re required reductions coming from the people in this room and all of your colleagues across the commodity space. At the same time, when you listen and talk with the World Resources Institute and the Science-Based Target Initiative, they also have this traceability requirement as, as part of the proof and due diligence in claiming carbon removals. And, and their, their standing point today is that until you have full traceability, don't risk your investments. You know, don't, don't, don't invest in supply chains that you don't know in your supply chains today, or sorry, investments in carbon that aren't in your supply chains today. Now, I find that to be quite a challenging counterbalance in the sense that we need to receive we need to reach a 1.5 degree limit on, on, on warming, which means a 7.6 degree reduction in carbon emissions per year. We have zero time to act. Yet at the same time, it may take us five, it may take us 10 years to get to the level of traceability that's required. So I very much take that to heart. And I'm curious, Angela, what do you see as the right level of traceability that confers your ability as Hershey's to be able to manage adoption, to be able to manage implementation of activities, 
but not so onerous that it blocks you from being able to fund and take action on these topics. Thanks for the question. Um, and I'm going to first just speak about Hershey. Um, and to answer that, it also, it's important to understand the business. And Hershey sources semi-finished cocoa products. Unlike other colleagues that may source beans directly, and they may have that in their supply chain. And that makes a big difference. So for someone like us, where we buy semi-finished products, and that's what we arrive in our factory, we have to pick our battles. And we have to focus the investments in origin where they are needed the most. So I agree with Mika that we need to have some level of segregation. And for us, we have defined that until the first point of purchase in origin. And then from then, it still needs to be under a system. So it's not just the Wild West there, but it needs to be under a mass balance or origin matching mass balance or some level of system that can reconciliate the data that comes from there. So that's one choice. Because we could also choose to go segregation all the way up to our factories. But that's going to require investment. And the investment choices that we have to make is do we invest in that supply chain, in building specific lines, or do we invest in that, or do we invest in finding what is needed in origin? So I think that's very balanced. It will be very different for companies that do have beans coming directly, and that will be, uh, it, will, it will just, it will just be different. I'm not going to go into details there. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to pick up with you, I think what we are sometimes missing in the 1.5, keeping, keeping temperatures below the 1.5 degrees is we need to start talking about or being more realistic about the individual carbon footprint. And if my memory doesn't fail me, just to give you an example, a software developer in California that is having a wonderful milkshake and changes an iPhone every six months, it has more or less the same footprint of 40 farmers in Uganda. And I feel that sometimes we are missing that bigger picture. So we can talk about footprint per country, but at some point we also need to think about footprint per capita. And, and in that, how do we transition and further accelerate the technologies that are almost there, renewable energy, and how do we avoid having to carbonize to develop? It's well, there you per go. Perfect timing well, for your slides. Perfect timing for your you slides. You will get it by email. <laughs> <laughs> and again, thank you, Angela, for, for giving your talk in absence of your slides. And maybe we can filter through these as, as we go through the questions. Um, and I think maybe extending it both for Olivier and for Angela, both of you represent actors. And, uh, and Angela, you alluded to this a little bit in your answer where you have supply chains that you don't necessarily directly manage yourself. You have multiple different supply chain intermediaries that you're interacting with um, on these topics of implementation, but also traceability. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to how do you manage the complexity of that? You have different service offerings coming to you from different suppliers, but you have your own requirements that you need to impose across the supply chains you work with. So just maybe a little bit of context on, on how you manage that and how complex that can be. Yeah, just... Uh can you hear me? Uh, okay. No, I think what is important here, and I mentioned, uh, you know, also in my presentation. I think first and foremost, uh, we need to demonstrate compliance, right? So, uh, and that for that we have developed the logic that we are applying. So, doing the ESG assessment, so assessing the risk level of each of your uh, categories, procurement categories, and and within that particular commodities, determines like which action you need to take. You can't do everything, and I know for, I think we are expected to prioritize, but you need to be able to provide the logic to justify why you prioritize one particular category or commodity over another one and where you go beyond and do more investments. I think that that's critical. Um, so I think, you know, we have to find, identify it through, uh, you know, uh, the tool that we built, which commodities uh, provide, you know, the, are, have a higher risk where we need to do more and then we go up the stairs, how, how far up. So for example, for uh, hazelnuts, palm oil, cocoa, we have developed also a cocoa charter, which outlines what we require from suppliers and where we go beyond with our own commitments. I think what is important, so that's first of all, very important in terms of complexity. And um, I mean, we do, for example, very small volume of, of coffee. So it's, it's not going to be, you know, where we're going to prioritize because compared to the volumes we do in palm oil, coffee or cocoa, hazelnuts, you know, that's where we're going to prioritize our focus uh, and, and go really far with traceability. Uh, 
I think the other point I want to mention as well, when we speak about trade speed, it's not just like, uh, you know, what is palm oil or cocoa, like mapping the farms or plantations and, and having the trade speed on the flow of the goods that you're buying that are delivered to you, but it's really collecting much more data that we put on the label of trade speed. So if you look at, uh, you know, it's tempting to, to talk about cocoa, but I will not do that. If I look at palm oil, you know, it's not just uh, the plantations. It's also, um, you know, there, of course, you have large, you know, owners of the large plantations. So it's more about labor rights and, and mapping that. And so uh, what are the labor, uh, the working conditions for the laborers on those plantations? Uh, what about indigenous communities in that area? I think the challenge with traceability is, and with sustainability programs, is also which data you want to collect or need to collect and, um, and which data don't, because you, know, you can go endless with data collection, but you need to identify which data is, is the core that you need to have and for what purpose are you gonna need it? So you wanna make the data work. And I think if you look at you know, my day-to-day -day work, that's one of the biggest challenges. Which data do I need and how do I make it work? And you know, for that purpose, we have source map, we have you know, Starling, uh, and also you know, other kinds of support. And I think if I look at you know, discussions within industry platforms, I think that's the, you know, the challenge that we all face, and not just like you know, our own data sets that we have, but how can we, in the pre-competitive arena, share certain data with each other, because we all know that we're operating in the same areas. Uh, so how can we share certain data that allows us to have more collective coordinated action? And I think that's the same for palm oil but also for, for, for cocoa or, or um, other commodities, you know, uh, and I think probably the cotton industry, yeah. you know, same thing. So knowing that you're on the same areas, how do you, can you work together, uh, you know, and, and, but also respecting GDPR, uh, which I think is, 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 is finding the right balancing act between what is expected from us in, for example, household income, but at the same time respecting data privacy. And I think that's the complexity that we have to deal with and it's a pity that the speakers from the previous session had to leave because I think this topic uh, requires the proper dialogue. And I think uh, to what Angela was saying, you know, uh, where do you want to create impact? I don't think you want to create impact by uh, throughout the entire supply chain, you know, creating the segregation because it's a high cost. It's, it's going to upset the entire supply chain. You want to create the impact on the ground, investing in the farmers and the communities. Um, and I think that's a dialogue we, we really want to have because, I mean, we have, I think, as Ferro, maybe the privilege that we buy mostly raw materials that we process internally, uh, which is a different sourcing model as some of the other, uh, you know, brands. But in the end, also we buy also part like as Moss Balance, which may be physical traceable at the beginning of the supply chain, but at some point in the supply chain, it gets mixed. So palm oil, we buy mostly uh, it's a liquid palm oil that we buy as uh, physically traceable, but there is a percentage, like uh, there's the complexity of palm oil derivatives. How do you ensure that? And I don't think that we should put our money in that. Uh, we should put our money really at uh, you know, the origin in the, with the farms and the communities. And, and I think that, that's very interesting. I think it's an interesting segue too, is, is when we look at these different models, um, and you, know, you allude to kind of cooperation, the fact that we need to look um, collaboratively at these questions that we need to solve. Mike, when you work on IP, uh, you know, identity preserved type landscapes, and you have certain farmers that are certified in a landscape, you are necessarily gonna have some farmers that may influence deforestation in that same landscape that don't fall under your system. So I'm curious how you as Rainforest Alliance see the fact that you have a really high level of detail, but that community of actors that you're working with only has a proportional influence on the deforestation that may occur in the landscape and how this ties into what Olivier said about, you know, requiring collaboration, requiring those types of approaches. Yeah, um, so I work in the standards and assurance department, right? So I'm mostly busy with, with the reach of the certification program. And farms that are not included in any certificate um, are beyond our scope. Whether they are not included because they were never in or be whether they are excluded from, from a certificate holder's scope because they are high risk. Um, we are, however, having information on these farms because we get registries of farms with the level of risk and we get, um, we get several instances. So we can compare them and see, compared to the last version that we have that is certified, which farms were high risk and were excluded. And we are building the platforms to be able to, to store that information 
um, which makes it also sort of our responsibility to, to do something with it, right? <laughs> um, and another part of the Rainforest Alliance is more project-based, and we have projects that are have a landscape approach. Um, but this is something that we cannot do alone, right? We need to collaborate and to work together to, to address the risks more at a landscape approach, um, look at, at these farms that were high risk or are high risk of deforestation and were excluded from certification, um, which is often, by the way, false negatives, right? It might be that they just did some heavy pruning and that they were identified as high risk. Um, so yeah, I think that there is a lot of, of work to be done there with, with this information. And you mentioned also data sharing, um, which is something we need to look at. Uh, at this moment, we have a meeting in the Rainforest Alliance to redefine our data sharing policy, also with this in mind. Um, but at least we can use that inf information at aggregated level for us to be able to target where, where most impact can be have. Ha yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And Rui, you know, and I alluded to it a little bit earlier, but Textile Exchange has made a dedicated approach to say segregated works for us and to build not only a, you know, ideological framework around that, but a technical framework around that. In the development of that and the choice to go with segregated with the types of farmers you had, what were some of the decision factors that led you to that being the correct solution for Textile Exchange? I think uh, from from our point of view was you know to keep the integrity of of the of the preferred fiber that we're working on that was one of the, the first things and I think you know um, access to data is is a challenge I think we're hearing that from from all of us and I think once you access that data it's a reconciliation of it and I think keeping um, a segregated system it was something um, that you know we, we we support to our standards by our chain of custody so that for us was a logical thing to do but I also think that you know having that level of segregation and traceability throughout the supply chain is the future because I think the next step is not just being able to segregate and identify something that's branded as prefer, but also have data that um, you know verifies the impact of that fiber or that material or cocoa, whatever that is, that actually has on the environment. Like Oliver was saying, I think you know the work that we need to do is to actually have an impact on the environment, on the climate, on with the farmers they're coming from. And um, that's that's the ultimate uh, intention of having these uh, traceability systems. And you know, keep it segregated from, from from my personal point of view, and I think from the organisation as well, it makes all the sense. Um, and I think the industry at large is doing that. We have other initiatives that that produce and promote. Uh, preferred cotton globally and they have the mass balance situation and they also moving to a more segregated um, uh, system but they also offer in both systems you know people are approaching in the same in the same way but I think in the end you know if, if you're not been able to identify and keep the integrity of that raw material throughout your supply chain it would be very difficult to then to validate the impact of that particular fiber as at the source fantastic and I think we have one or two minutes left is that correct one minute, okay. Maybe just a final question then for anybody who's, who's willing to delve into this. The farmer is a fundamental piece of this puzzle, right? And we talk about certification, we talk about action, and unfortunately, as part of that action, we often put a, lot, a significant load on the shoulders of the farmers with regard to whether it's labor, whether it's addressing their profitability and hurting their profitability if we go for, you know, name, name a different system, right? Everything requires some resources. Let's take that piece out of the equation. If we take a certified system, assume those costs are, bear, are borne to some degree by the farmer, the additional costs for traceability. Is this more work for a farmer generally? Is it more work for a supply chain intermediary? Where does that burden of traceability really fall within the supply chain? I, I can start. Um, so actually, this I asked this question to Grace Hazare that couldn't be here today uh, because we didn't get the passport on time. That's another story. Um, and she is working, she's one of the cocoa leader farmers in the Kakum landscape. And I just asked her, what does traceability mean to you? And she said, look, we've been working in this landscape since 2018, and I cannot answer that question. I don't understand. I just understand that if I give you information, if I share details about my life, because I don't know how many of you really know what level of detail is being shared by all these farmers. 
There's literally people coming into your house and asking you, how did you spend your money in the last year? And in what? And if you bought a beer, why did you do that? And shouldn't you be spending on A, B, or C? So there are, it's quite intense getting to get data. So again, the field teams need to know how to ask these questions. And I'm just going to finish there in saying, so what is the additional cost? It's also, it, it goes two ways. Sometimes it works for them because it gives them a different profile. And it allows them to have different conversation in their, in their communities, in, in their villages. But sometimes that also backfires because all these plans get unfunded. And I think that's what we hear a lot. Like plans where, again, I don't know how many of you know, but to improve productivity or the soil in a farm, you're talking about more than 40 decisions that you need to take in less than 30 minutes. How do you do that without support? So I, that's, again, to finish the point is, so what is the additional cost other than that is actually also fulfilling promises? And that sometimes is very difficult because there may be other priorities. Fulfilling promises in the sense, building the plant and the farmers saying, yes, I am going to fertilize next year. But something came back, came up, and they may not have. And those are the challenges that at least I heard from the farmers that we work with. Perfect. And it looks like Olivia has one more comment and then we'll wrap up. Does that sound good? I think maybe considering the fact that Angela was so challenged without presenting her slides, I think it might be appropriate to have her had the, f the final word on this one, if you don't mind. Sounds good, sounds good, perfect. Well, thank you very much. This is obviously not the last conversation everybody in this room will have about traceability. Um, I really appreciate everybody's time, and particularly Elizabeth Howard, too, who really supported putting this panel together. Um, really great insights, really good information. It's really grown my understanding of the world of traceability as well, so I thank you for that. So thank you to all the panelists for participating in your insights into this space.